in 93. He's currently a principal facilitator and coordinator in forums and workshops throughout Kaduna State for the Global Peace Foundation. So thank you for joining us. And on my left is Dr. Usman Bugaji, who is the convener of the Ariwa Research and Development Initiative. Uh, Dr. Bugaji um, has an MA in African Studies and a PhD in Intellectual History, has worked with the Islam Islamic, um, Islam in Africa organization, IOC, and taught at Amadou Bello University, Zaria, and also the University of Meduguri, Nigeria. He's a prolific writer and commentator on national issues, and he's the founding chairman of Network for Justice, an advocacy group concerned with promoting civil education, consumer, and human rights. Doctor, thank you so much for coming. Okay, so... Um, as a way of sort of um, introduction, um, I think it's important to say that many people, particularly those who are not from the North and who don't know too much about the North, tend to look at it as one large mono-ethnic single faith um, region, when in, when in fact it's actually made up of multiple ethnic groups and people of different religious persuasions, um, a handful of even no religion at all. Um, we have experienced our fair share of religious violence in parts of northern Nigeria, and this conversation is really uh, us attempting to have an open and frank discussion about that problem, and some might say trying to see if we can find a solution. So the topic does suggest, and if I could start with you, um, Reverend, that there is a problem of intolerance when it comes to um, religion in the north, would you agree? Uh, thank you very much. Let me thank uh, the organizers of this program for inviting me. Actually, uh, the invitation wasn't mine, but I was recommended by the person that's supposed to be here. That's uh, Bishop Kuka. He recommended to the organizers that they should invite me, and I thank this. I take this as a great honor to stand in for that erudite speaker. Those who we may have met in the past will know that I'm still crawling when you compare to Kuka, but I am also a little bit knowledgeable in the things we do around here. To answer your question quickly, I will say it's a yes and no answer. Is there religious intolerance in northern Nigeria? It's a yes and no answer. It all depends on where you're coming from. It's a yes answer if you are coming from the angle of judging everything, even what they have not consulted us. Because when you know the North very well, as a young man, I'm privileged by God to have lived. I was actually born in Boko. I grew up in Makodi. My parents hailed from Southern Kaduna. I am Ham by tribe. I stayed and worked in Kano. I schooled sometimes in ABU and also in the seminary here. And I'm doing another master's program in Ibaja. So I've had a little share of going around. An ordinary northerner don't know those differences as sometimes it is magnified because what they believe is that they idolize each other. I grew up to know how a typical Hausa Muslim northerner idolized a Joseph, a John from Southern Kaduna or from Jos and want to bear his name. And a typical John, John and Joseph from Southern Kaduna idolized an Abu Bakr and Abdul Malik, a TJ as we would like to call from Sokoto, from Katsina, from Kano. So you see, the ordinary northerner celebrate and appreciate the other person. But elites, since they are privileged to speak to the world, they begin to paint us an intolerance group. And so when they did not find success, they begin to instigate us about each other for their selfish interests. And most time when we begin to dance, okay, you know, because there are different categories of people. There are people who give in to those instigations. So when those few individuals who give in to instigation dance to the tunes of what the elites want them to do, it is assumed, it is the practice and the view of the whole northerners. But I can say to you that as northerners, we can say no. There is no religious intolerance. But it is also yes, because there is that practice. So since we've not gotten rid of that practice, you can say yes to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Dr. Bugaji, 
do you agree with his assessment of um, the situation? He's working, just talk. Hello. Thank you. I would rather admit that there is a religious intolerance. Now, it can exhibit itself in different ways and forms. And if we analyze, we can bring out more than what the eye needs. Religion is an instrument that can be manipulated. And it has been manipulated. It is being manipulated. But there is also a sense in which, at an ordinary level, the perception is religious. Even if the subcontext and the actual forces that create that kind of clash or conflict may be informed or generated by bad governors. My own perception and understanding, and I'm basing this on a number of other studies that have been done, is that too often religion provides the rhetoric. It provides you the argument. But when you dig deeper, you find certain forces pushing. Sometimes it is elite competing for attention or looking for some political concessions. So they will manipulate because it is amenable to manipulation. So I would say that there is uh, a religious intolerance, but I would say that too often it is a reflection of a number of other uh, forces or factors. So at one level, you have manipulation by the political elite. At one level, you have manipulation by the religious elite themselves. You know, when they do tough protection, they want to promote themselves, they want to maintain certain privileges, and therefore they have to uh, ensure that they protect their tough the area of influence that they have. Okay, because so you do have... We're going into the why. Ju just, just one yeah. moment. You have both inter-religious and you have also intra-religious conflicts, Absolutely. as you know. Yes, yes. And it's very good that we, you know, analyze carefully to be able to separate rather than lump the whole thing together. But mm -hmm. there is a level of intolerance, but I think it is largely manipulated by either political elites or religious elites or even you know, created by bad governors. So the question is, um, and you started touching on it, the, the question of why. Why is it easy in this part for the politi politicians, for the elite, like he put them, to, to use a tool like religion to manipulate? Religion makes itself particularly amenable, meaning it's easy because a lot of the thinking and the minds of people top, you know, and the most emotional element that you can easily whip is religion. Because for many, that is what derives or that's what basically informs their lives. And so is is the key factor in you know human life. It informs the whole of life. And therefore, it is one of the most effective you know, tools that you can use. And it's easy, it's cheap, because it's very easy to, to manipulate. And it is important that uh, we also look at the level of education in society. The higher the level of education, the more difficult for manipulation to take place. The lower the level, because at a higher level, you will ask questions. When someone comes with a statement, you would want to probe further. But when the level of education is low, as it is in the great majority of our society at the moment, people don't ask questions. When you come, people are usually presumptuous. Whatever you bring, it is assumed to be so. And people act on it. And this is part of why it is easy for those who are manipulating it. This intolerance, how has it manifested, and what has been the impact on our communities? Uh, let me put it this way. Intolerance have actually manifested in such a way that we no longer appreciate and celebrate those who
can contribute their expertise among us, where we judge them and post it to northern Nigeria. He comes as a police commissioner. His job is to secure us. His job is to get rid of crime. His job is to ensure that there is law and order. But the first reception is, what is his tribe? What is his religion? And I ask myself this question. If you are sick and you go to hospital, do you ask the tribe of the doctor or you ask an expert in a particular field? If your car breaks down on a Volvo mechanic or you ask for a Muslim mechanic or a Christian mechanic. But you know, in, north, in the north, this intolerance exists a bit from this angle I'm saying. Now, okay, the commissioner of police is a Christian. No, he's a Muslim. We don't trust him. He's going to be anti-Christian. He's a Christian. No, we don't trust him. He's going to be anti-Muslim. And these kind of things also manifest even at the state level. If you are posted to be a permanent secretary in a ministry, the first judgment is not about, you wow, are, we've been working as civil servant. This is a good man. This is a great man. He can move this ministry forward. No, no, no. He's a Christian. He's a Muslim. I doubt he's going to do it. Oh, a commissioner, you can go further to minister, you can go further to governor, and then you round up to the president. So when this kind of manifestation of judging people by not what they can contribute, but by their religious affiliation or their tribal identity, it makes a lot of ridicule of what we are doing. That is why when I answered first, I said, it is a yes and no answer. Because the ordinary man celebrates governor, not Christian, not Muslim. The ordinary man celebrates someone who can do something good. But the elites now make him see that. You see, this good man you are thinking is not of your faith. He's not of your tribe. So though he is good, as you say, but he will only be more good to the other people. So that is when the, man, the, 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 the ordinary man begins to have his mind poisoned. But ordinarily, if you know how to do well, the ordinary man will clap for you. A good number of you in this, whole, uh, in this hall this afternoon are young men. When Nigerians play football, we don't know a football player that is a Muslim or a football player that is a Christian or a football player that is a Hausa or a football player that is a, uh, a Northerner or a Southerner. We just know a good football player. And we celebrate them and clap for them. Have you asked yourself a question that when they team up together in the midst of the field to pray, which religious prayer they offered? But you see, when we come down home, some people then manipulate it and now begin to explain it on the basis of appointment, opportunities, riches, and so on. So now, what we did not know about, we begin to see them and hear them in those. Okay, but when me... there is success, we celebrate success of Nigerian winning ball without knowing whether the goal was scored by a Muslim or a Christian. Yeah, let me bring Dr. Bugaji in. We, we hear stories about um, a North which actually is reflected in the analogy of football that he used. We are told there was a time in Northern Nigeria when these differences were not so um, visible and people lived side by side, and you didn't have riots in which people were getting killed incessantly based on um, the faith they belong to or the tribe they belong to. What went wrong in your view? Many things went wrong. But let me also address the point that he has made, and this is important. Uh, the Premier of Northern Nigeria, <coughs> Sir Amadi Bello, was known to uh, take donations from outside the country for the promotion of Islam. In Bochi, at one time, he gave this money to Christians to help build a mosque out of trust. This is on records. Just to show you, a few years back, all these things did not exist. So, where did they come from? They came from a number of factors. But the leading factor for me is bad governance. You know, when people, you know, started deviating from the very high standards, because during that period, people were appointed to offices, not so much on the base of their tribe or region, but based on their competence. And the fact that, you know, bad governance, you know, breeds the first thing he does is to compromise competence, to bring in people not on the basis of their ability to perform the work, but from where they come from. And uh, this is where it all started. You might want to say that from 1966, when the military came, you know, they changed the rules and things started to get down the drain. 
And because of that, a lot of what came later, you know, created this stampede. Everybody trying to, you know, find his way there for his own personal or for the group interest or for tribal interest or for religious interest. And the actual interest of the community, the country itself, was uh, subjugated to those group and personal interests. So I think that is it. But also, there is the problem of development, problem of quality of education, level of development, generally. It's all part of bad governance, but key to this is that with very poor education, it is easy to be manipulated. And if our society has actually benefited from good education, they would have been in a position to query a lot of things you know, that, 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 that come, I mean, that, uh, that, that, that they confront. But at the moment, many people, and <clears throat> you see it in the culture of the new media, people receive things in their WhatsApp platform or Facebook. They don't question. They just simply forward it. Now, this is, for me, an indication of a poorly educated society. Okay, let me bring the reverend in. Uh -huh. um, without dismissing the sort of uh, important issues he's raised, um, I've spoken to people who've said, well, yeah, those are factors, but it's a little bit more complicated than that because part of what has also happened is you've got a region where there was a dominance of one particular um, ethnic group or one religion, and you've got minorities that started trying to assert themselves and fight for their rights, and there's been resistance to that particular thing, and that has led to tension. What do you think? Well, let me just take it from where he stopped. Hmm. During the Sardona era, as students of history, we understand that he picked even people among Christians community, other tribal communities to work with him. Interestingly, in the time we live, as you rightly put forward, we have a situation where someone now is now coming and is seeing Sardona as a weak leader. Why did he even give opportunity for people like Sunday or Wonei to be? Why did he give opportunity for people like Talka to be? Why shouldn't it have been another Abdullah or another Mustafa? And so in their own thinking, how do we now correct it? And because probably because of the opening he gave to others, you have voices, and they think they should stop it, and which has actually led to some of the reaction. But let me also put this very clear. Whether we like it or not, they do not have this reality of religious history. That when the colonial masters came to northern Nigeria, they deliberately asked missionaries who we are going around to establish schools, not to establish schools in Muslim dominated area. They felt that could create problem for them. And so they referred the missionaries to the pagan community. And the pagan community are those tribes you talk about today. So when the missionaries went to the pagan community, preached to them and established schools, the first product is Children of those pagan communities quickly became educated, well informed, but the system still have to respect the current leadership to decide who becomes what. History have it very clear that even the platform that the great Sardona and others did, the Barodico and Co. brought about it because they were well informed. But you see, when opportunities came, they didn't have problem to have Sardona going. But when more people begin to come out of this community and are becoming informed and have better opportunities. But you have a situation where you go to become a director general and somebody who probably just graduated day before yesterday is coming to be director general and you've been there for 15, 20 years and you are not competent on the basis of your tribe or religion. Those are the things that begin to hit up. But I still want to make reference to the larger knot because I find the larger knot more interested than the very few knots that are causing us the problem. The larger knot is a knot of the common man, the knot that respects another person, the knot that receives even a stranger and puts him in his house, the knot that do not despise you because of your faith or your tribe. I still believe that if not, will appreciate what the larger common people in the knot see life from. All these things we are saying will not be. Sometimes people argue and tell us that the problem of not is lack of education. 
as much as I subscribe the need for education and I want education, I can tell you that the problem of the North is not the illiterate man. The problem of the North is the educated man. He is the selfish man. He is the greedy man. He is the troublemaker. So, because they do went to school together with John and Abdullahi and graduated, and now they become competitors. For Musa and Jacob that are farming, they are not competing at anything than just farm to eat their food. So, you see, this whole thing, sometimes the discourse about not has always been about the elites. And then you assume as if the elites own the not. The fact is that I want to subscribe and say that until the common not stand up and say, wait, who do you think you are representing, me or yourself? This whole thing will not stop. So you can bring in all the academic analysis. The problem is an abuse of the common not. Because as long as the common not seems not to understand the pos his position, every day the story will be as if he is a secondary person. He is the primary person. Because we make the not, not the elites. The elites are even far away from the not. We sit here, but they chase us out of our homes and make us enemies of each other because of their selfish interests. So when you ask me this kind of question, I do know that education caused this problem. But I celebrate the common man down there. My father was part of them, or my grandfather, my mom or grandmother was part of them. And I realized that they never told me any bad thing about a non-Christian, a non harm man, or a non jabber as you, most of you would want to call. They always speak well about the other people. And they even name some of us with the names. I bear the name Hayab today. I attach the name Hayab today to my name because when I was working with Realistic Investment Equity in 1987 in Kanu, uh, I think Hamza Zayat was came to the office one day and just asked me, young man, are you a northerner? I said, yes, but why are you having all English names? Because I was just Joseph John. <laughs> why are you having an English name? I thought deeply about it. And when I, I decided to write another exam and added the name Hayab, he was a Muslim, but today is the name everybody knows me, Reverend Hayab, not even Joseph. Mm. Now, okay, so um, um, issues around governance, the poor man, and yet I keep coming back to this because, you know, we said we want to have a frank conversation. Islam, which is the dominant religion in the North, now has a universal reputation for being intolerant. And within northern Nigeria, that intolerance um, doesn't extend only to Christians, it is thought. We have even, and you made reference to this when you first spoke, you have even internal sect issues. So one sect of Islam, you know, looking at another sect of Islam as being unbelievers. To what extent is the philosophy and the makeup of Islam as practiced in northern Nigeria responsible for some of the problems that we have here. Thank you very much. But let me <clears throat> just address the point he made. It's important, I mean, he made the point that governance stopped being inclusive. And it's important to register the point he made that in the northern Nigerian government under the, under Sir Bello, he was particularly inclusive, not only Muslim, Christian, even generational. And some of the young people here might be interested to know that there was a 21-year-old as a minister in the cabinet of Sadawna, who later on became the Emir of Mori. The point I'm making is that Sadawna was conscious of representing everybody. The government was inclusive. So part of the conflict which elite manipulates is because of exclusion. So coming to the point we have raised, it's a very important point. Again, 30, 40 years down the line, these problems did not exist. And the reputation you talked about, Adria, is a reputation created by Western media. Because the truth, again, when you look at it, is not exactly what is represented. Okay, and Partly, but let me say this, let me say no, this. When, let, let when me you have, no, you, and you, can, you will talk a bit more, but okay. when you have incidents in which you know, because a cartoonist, you know, um, drew pictures somewhere in far away Denmark, and then people in northern Nigeria decide as a result mm -hmm. they're going to attack people. Or an argument between two people in the market, you know, um, leads to the cutting off of a head of a woman who is said to have desecrated the, the Quran. Mm -hmm. It is very difficult for you to convince people that these are purely media stories you know, put by the, the Western media, because they have real practical things now, that are going on. Now, there has been 
extensive studies done on these very issues. There is a professor, Robert Pepp, who in Chicago, who has done a lot of studies on this. You have heard about Mercy Corps, maybe, the International Human Rights Group, that actually go to trouble spots in the world to interview young people who are accused of all these things. There is also uh, a book that has been written on war and peace. A lot of these studies have discovered that these instances that you talk about are basically created not by the religion. Religion just provides the cover. It's actually an expression of that exclusion. When societies feel excluded, when people feel there is bad governance, they develop a religion, because religion is the only thing really that they can use to express that particular anger. A lot of these things have been studied. In fact, in the case of Robert Pepp, every terrorist attack that has taken place anywhere in the world has been traced from the people who did it, the people who claimed, right down to the source. And he has established with empirical evidence beyond any reasonable doubt that religion is only used as a rhetoric as a cover. But the real causes for these things have to do with the local perception of exclusion or injustices. Within the intra-faith conflict, again, there is what we have all started talking about, manipulation by religious leaders. I talked about tough protection. People who feel their only way of building their own empire and making a lot of money is by creating those kind of divisions. Those of you who have closely watched politics, you know how the campaigns are done. The ulama will always be there in the mosques to you know, uh, participate, not so much for the welfare of the people, but to become prominent enough to qualify for the seats for the Umrah and Hajj that they receive. And there is a competition between the Izala and the Tariqa. And all of them try to see who can ingratiate himself with, uh, you know, to, to the government to be able to make the, 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 the greatest gain. I have said it a number of times. One of the first things that happens, you see, uh, a political leader who has been elected, who has actually rigged the elections. It's everybody's knowledge that these elections are rigged. One of the first group of people that go there are the ulama and the Christian clergy. And this, everybody knows that this election was rigged. But they go there, they pray for him, and they collect whatever they collect. And I sometimes said, God forbid that he answers these kind of prayers. Because it means that this kind of thing that, you know, is going to continue. So I think we need to be a little more careful, not lumping things together. We need to be analytical. We need to do research. We need to do interviews. All these things that I have, you know, sources that I have indicated have done these interviews. And people can Google them and they can read them and they can see. In fact, the argument that a lot of the conflicts around the world are caused by religion have been studied from Greek antiquity, through the major you know, wars in the world, to the current conflicts, whether it is in Syria or in Lebanon or in Iraq or in Yemen or in Libya, everything has been studied and there has been a lot of research. I've attended a lot of conferences on this. And the facts on the ground speak to the fact that there is either exclusion or there is manipulation. And therefore, we can't, as scholars, accept the run-of-the-mill thing that journalists you know, dish out. But the fact of the matter is that a lot of these things have to do with these major principal sources, manipulation, exclusion, which is an aspect of bad governance, and I insist the level of education. Yes, he talked about the ordinary person. The perception in the ordinary, on the ordinary person is itself changing. 
30, 40 years back because of the kind of leadership, because of the inclusions in government, the ordinary person did not feel as threatened as he is today. He did not feel as excluded as he is today. He did not feel as bad me, as he feels yeah, today. Let me bring and therefore, up. these are the kind of feelings that inform, you know, that release this anger. And this, the, the mere fact that people don't have confidence in government at the moment, as they used to have previously, and this is, you know, uh, very clear. So these are the issues that I think we should be focusing when we discuss these issues. Okay, now, so if we accept exclusion, for example, as the um, catalyst for some of the problems we, the, we see within our communities and manipulation by um, sometimes religious leaders, the ulama and the clergy, um, why is that exclusion almost inevitably manifested in attacks against other regular people as opposed to the people who have excluded you? In other words, when these conflicts happen, inevitably it's your neighbors that you attack. You don't, you know, get in your bus and go to Abuja or in to, to, to the government house. What is responsible for that? And I'm asking all these questions because ultimately what we want to do is try and see how the issues can be resolved. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, this whole effort to make the intolerance attitude of northern Nigeria as just an issue of exclusion is there, but uh, I have tried to explain that the common fertilizer for Muslim, no fertilizer for a chap, no fertilizer that is different for Hausa man, they all buy the same fertilizer. So the problem of exclusion, as sometimes we feel, is because the elites rotate power among themselves. So the next man who you think is an angel that is coming to power is just coming from the same company and association of the elites. So because he comes with the mentality of the associations of the elites, he is going to just continue the exclusion. Unfortunately for the common man, there is a system in this country that all of us know that nobody accepts responsibility for a mistake. If I make a mistake and they are challenging me for my mistake, instead of saying, I'm deeply sorry, as your commissioner of education, I fail, I didn't provide food for school for children, it's by saying, actually, I did not fail, but there was sabotage in the office. <laughs> and the sabotage, because his thinking is that our big man on top did not succeed, not because he's not good. He did not succeed because one other person, who is this? And there is, I must confess to you that, okay, let's inflict pains on his people so that he will know that he has stepped on the toes of our leader. I work for an organization called Global Peace Foundation Nigeria. We've been engaged in going to local, our approach in our organization is to go to local community and talk about peace. It is not about bringing people to one big hotel and discuss with them. We go to local communities. And when we started meeting local people and find out why they fight, it will surprise you to know why they fight. It will surprise you to know why the killings in southern Kaduna, why all the problems, but among the Fulanese and the natives. In most cases, it's just, okay, they touched one of our big men yesterday, and so, so relations were involved. Now let's go to their community, inflict pains on them so that they know we exist. So this manipulation, as he has said over and over again, used to be done by elites just to keep the ordinary man fighting and confused. I have decided on my own that instead of overblowing the elite manipulation, I want to begin to speak to the ordinary man. I want to begin to speak to the conscience of the ordinary young man, to the ordinary person in the village, so that they will begin to understand, because unless you have the ordinary person to understand that he's being used, unless you help him to understand that after said and done, he still begin to, he's still the one that will be abandoned to feel the pains. Anything you try to justify by whether, uh, let's say, receipt, but his child can grow to, despite the fact that he has seen one or two, but he assumed that that other one that became, became because he joined the club. They never knew that he, their son can just become without joining any club. 
So if we look at manipulation and ordinary people killing themselves, it's just a simple way of reaching out to them and beginning to sensitize them and help them understand the things they are doing, the advantage they to hurt each other. You started an example that I'm familiar with. I'm familiar with just explain. Where's clergy in Nigeria to open, including our regular BBC and others? Two days later, some ulamas went to the governor then in Borno and simply just request for something. Okay, we are not going to protest. We are just allowed to that he's going to the stadium to fight his neighbor. He was told he's going to the stadium to pray. And ordinarily, if you ask me to come and pray, would I say no? I'm trying to see that this whole thing is about helping the local man to understand how they are manipulating him, as he's rightly said. But the reality is still that does he really go to fight or someone have an agenda and want to use him to achieve the agenda? So help the local man to understand the agenda that is being pursued that is not even his agenda. Because I have always said this and I want to repeat to this gathering, that if anybody come to me and want to instigate me to fight you because you are a Muslim, the reality about it is that there is nothing about his agenda that promotes Christianity. Okay, no, so and, and that's a good place for me to, to come in because of course we've said, you know, um, this manipulation isn't only by... Um, political um, leaders, it's not only about politicians, the clergy, the clergy uh, as yeah, well yeah, as yeah, ulamas are responsible. Um, how do you see the role of the Christian Association of Nigeria regarding um, some of the issues that we face in the North? Because you have faced strong criticisms um, about the role you've played in promoting harmony and unity. Okay. Uh, I'm happy that I'm the person speaking today, so I can correct some wrong impressions. Before I became the current secretary of Kaduna State, precisely on November 27, 2002, the impression in Kaduna State is that you dare not go to the secretariat of Khan because you will not come out alive. That is true. Those who are part of Kaduna for this past decade will agree with me that I changed that story. I brought Muslim leaders to Khan. I personally attend many tafsir many iftar, many programs, to the extent that the NTA were shocked one day they saw me in one big tafsir I didn't announce that I was coming, but in my castle. Now, I also on the perception. These things do happen when you have a leader who do not have an experience of interpersonal, interreligious relationship. But it is not an acceptable practice of the association. I want to differentiate what the association stands for and what one leader probably did or is doing wrong. I hope you understand this. So the association does not stand for that. I have said that. Let me, is let me ask you a specific okay. question because we do have an incident that is going on right now as we talk. There's a debate about the school curriculum. And the Christian Association of Nigeria is reported to be very unhappy with changes that they say have been made to the curriculum. In fact, the, the news which has been reported and which has been reported wrongly is that uh, uh, there's an imposition of Islamic religious studies on the curriculum. Now, first thing is those changes took place under a Christian president two years ago. At that time, the Christian Association of Nigeria did not issue any statements to say that the way um, and manner in which the changes to the curriculum around religious studies and the study of Arabic as a language was done, they were unhappy with it. So this was during Jonathan's time that these changes took place. And then you wake up today and Khan has issued a statement condemning these changes, giving people the impression that a Muslim president, um, Buhari, has actually come and changed the curriculum in order to Islamize what our children are learning. It is a bit irresponsible, isn't it, on the part of Khan to do things like this? Well, it depends on the knowledge you have about the debate. Mm. Because sometimes, as you, he rightly said earlier, the newspapers can misrepresent the entire story. Okay, I count this whole mix up as part of the problem of Nigeria's secrecy in governance. We don't open up for conversations. We are not plain when it comes to issue. The issues have since been manipulated to the extent that no one has the right version of the story. 
Even governments, who seems to be telling us our version, will sell this in the morning and in the evening they will counter it and say another one. But it is a very simple issue. The issue is, in this country, there is a need for Christians and Muslims to study in schools. And part of the requirement is Christians study CRK, Muslims study IRK. I went through that. I used to tell my Muslim friends that I actually, because of my interest, attend IRK class, though I never wrote an exam to award it. But I can tell you what I learned today. I can tell you these citations and others. My father wasn't a house man or a Muslim, so I have a background. But what I'm saying is that when you come up with a curriculum improvement or development, and you are doing it with so much secrecy and confusion, and listed, if the stories, the confused stories is that there was a need to decide whether you read CRK or Arabic. You see, there's no comparison there. It's supposed to be a CRK or IRK. But these are all the confusion the ministry herself are given. It's not because someone is. And when people say that this whole thing was there when Jonathan was in power, I quite agree. That is part of governance and manipulation of those who are in power. If Jonathan was in government and there was no mention of it because it has not come to public light and it came to public light, if anybody in government find out that this thing can trigger a problem, let, it, let him stop it. In 2004, after the Miss World, 2003, after the Miss World beauty pageant crisis, the then governor, McCarthy, felt strongly that there was a problem with our school system. And he decided to choose 10 schools in Kaduna State and start what he called a model school and set up boards in such school. And in each of these boards, there must be a Christian, there must be a Muslim. The essence of it is that when you look at the activities and the curriculum of the school and understand that something is going wrong, you can address it without allowing people to manipulate and create tension. Today in this country, there are simple things that we will do and people cannot talk, will not talk. We don't do them. But we keep secrecy, we tell people stories. You go to this ministry, they tell you this. You go to this director, he tells you this. I will earlier give you an example and which is happening in most of our ministries. A Christian who serves a ministry of education sincerely knows that the document is not like this, but for selfish reason can come out with a document that shows that it comes from the ministry as if it is from the ministry. Okay, a Muslim me... who also serves in the ministry can also come mm -hmm. out with a document or go to his malam and say, look, they are trying to do something that is anti-Islam. Don't agree. And by the time they create confusion, government cannot really come out and say, look, wait a minute. Let's look at what is the curriculum. Print it out and let us read it. Okay, and, and, and at some point we must discuss what the responsibility then should be of um, religious bodies. But, you know, it's not only Christian leaders that are guilty of this. So the ulama, for example, that you make reference to, I've heard um, um, sermons that are sort of passed on phones where essentially you're told uh, you're not a Muslim if you are able to vote for a Christian leader and if you are not a, you know, so we, we, we don't have ulamas who say, for example, vote for him because he's a good man. He will improve the country. It's always about he has to be your religion. And they stalk hate, not only among, um, between Muslims and Christians, but also among Muslim sects. So, you know, I, I get WhatsApp telling me that Shiites are going to hell and that they are not Muslims and we should kill them, we should do that sort of thing. It is pretty disturbing. And, and the issue is, wh what do we do? Well, the first thing is that this ulama, or scholars, are not actually ulama. Yeah, but they call themselves ulama. Fair and enough. people believe they are fair ulama. Fair enough, fair enough, but they are not. <laughs> and I can tell you what's happened. In the last 40 years or so, 30, 40 years, there was a major change within the Islamic discourse. And uh, the Salafis came in. And Salafism, one of the things it does is it cheapens knowledge. People listened to preaching over cassettes, and they became ulama. And they grew beard, and they start putting things on the top of their head. <laughs> but inside their head, actually, there is nothing. <laughs> and you find these are the people today that pass for ulama. And they call themselves all sorts of names. And, and it's a very dangerous situation. For example, at the moment, we have a lot of Islamia schools. You are familiar with Islamia schools. Anybody today can open his garage and throw some mats and get a young man with a very short trouser, nice beard, with a smattering of Arabic, 
God knows where he learned anything. Nobody knows, you know, no, nobody actually checks his qualification. And he starts teaching. And he doesn't, you, I mean, even the, the person who employed him would have been in the market or somewhere making a daily living, and he doesn't even know what is being taught. Now, these are the kind of situations. It's because our government over the years have been irresponsible. No government in the world allows these kind of things to happen. But you see, two things I would like to make. Let it be very clear that a lot of these conflicts, religion is just simply a tool. Look at Rwanda, for example. Is, 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 is the one, I mean, is the largest genocide in Africa. Where is Islam there? In fact, some of the Christian clergy that actually hid some of the uh, Hutus, uh, you know, actually organized for their massacre. And these are Christians. The point I'm making is that we need to dig deeper. We should not be satisfied with what meets the eye. We need to go deeper. And when we go deeper, we get the real problem and we can resolve them. Then, uh, 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 in, in terms of awareness, I want to make this point also. The, I mean, what he said was very important, but we, has, we have to go down to the ordinary people. But you see, the ulama will protect, even the Christian clergy will protect him from reaching the ordinary people. Because you are going to be undoing and you'll be narrowing their power base. Anybody who tries to get across to the ordinary people and tell them the real truth is going to be blocked by ulama because they are the only beneficiaries to these things. And when you speak, there is a problem of communication between Muslims and Christians. They are not communicating. And part of the problem of communication is that even when they speak, and you find that even in interfaith gatherings, and I do attend quite a number of them, it's that there is a particular thing that blocks that communication that we have to work on. And permit me to illustrate it with a story that some of you may be familiar with. There was this uh, story of uh, an advert. A new washing powder was being promoted. And uh, the advert of washing powder is very well known, isn't it? You have uh, dirty cloth on your left. You have the cloth dipped in the washing powder. And then you have clean, sparkling clothes. And this was in the, one of the countries of the Arab world. These adverts ran for so many months, the washing powder was not picking up. So they brought an expert to look at what is going wrong. And he immediately detected that the person who did the advert was a Western company. So dirty clothes on the left, washing powder in the middle, and you have sparkling cloth there. Now the Arab starts writing and reading from right to left. So what they actually see is that very clean cloth on this side <laughs> dipped on you know, the washing powder and some very crazy kind of you know, thing. So, so sometimes you, you miss the point in not really communicating. So this is why it's important to look at things closely and pick out you know, those things that are, are there. Okay, so let's start talking because I'm running out of time and I need to at least get people to ask questions. Let's talk solutions. How do we begin to address this intolerance and to make sure that the poor man um, isn't manipulated as a result of feeling excluded and that manifests in attacks against people of other faiths? My own is that we have to correct governance. Because governance is what is going to block anything that you're going to do at the moment. I think my priority is how do we change the way we recruit leaders. At the moment, under democracy, as you know, I mean, the people that you call leaders, a lot of them, a lot of them are very well-known crooks. <laughs> oh, yes. I mean, let's, let's, I mean, everybody knows. A lot of them are very well-known crooks. Why? Because the system that recruits leadership is flawed and is based on, you know, mercantile and, and, and monetary, you know, aspect. Now, that is what we have to work to block. And then when responsible leaders come, credible leaders, 
Because a lot of them have not really, I mean, some of them have not really had good education. The kind of education commensurate to the responsibilities they are holding. And a lot of them are there just to make money. And because of this, all this confusion in governance that he's talking about, you know, is raging. So I think my priority would be how do we fix that recruitment system? And the recruitment system under democracy is through the political party. Go and see who are the people running the political parties. I have run a political party, so I can tell you authoritatively, the people who are running those political parties are not elected because they are competent. They are there because they represent an interest outside. A governor you know, wants his own man to be the secretary of the party so that he can manipulate it. Uh, a president wants his own man. Every big politician, you know, with the, you know, the, the money bag, wants somebody who can. Now we have to eliminate the system. It is, you know, fixing this recruitment, leadership recruitment system is what's going to bring leaders that you can actually talk to, that you can actually, you know, uh, engage. At the moment, a good number of them really have no idea of even how to govern. And all their focus is how do they make more money and more money and more money. Okay. Once we do that, once we do that, then those who are enlightened from among the Christians and among the Muslims can work under an atmosphere that is sensitive, that is ready to correct and make recommendations. Okay. But we have to phase out this false ulama. I don't know, Reverend, if you have the equivalent, you know. We have to remove them and bring people with knowledge, and then things will start getting better. Okay, so, so governance, big, yeah. big issue. Yeah, Are there other things? Yeah, uh, but even in the issue of governance, as my uh, colleague said here, I sometimes have some little concern when we overflow the issue of governance as someone having a lot of education. A governor or a leader who has no humanity whether he has a professoral degree is not good to lead us. Most of the problem we have with those leading us is not the education, lack of humanity. A father treats his children with that humanity. A mother treats her children with that humanity. If you become our leader and humanity cease to exist in you, your education will not help you in leadership at all. So we are having this challenge. Leaders come in to now see themselves, they are no longer human beings, they are spirits. <laughs> but when they were seeking for office, they were human. But when they became leaders, they ceased to be human, they are spirit. Nobody tells them anything, they know everything. Before you say one word, they have answers. If you offer them suggestions, their suggestion does not matter. When you begin to treat human beings like that, even if you come with the whole knowledge on earth, you will get resistance. And then the elite can also manipulate this and say, you can see, he cannot listen to us, neither can he listen to you. So we need human beings to come and lead us. Some of the people leading us now are not good human beings. I'm sorry to say this. But having said this, the other side, just to add to what you said, is the religious leaders. The fact about it is that I've heard him say this several times that there are quacks among. You know that we have a lot of quack pastors too. Because someone was a mechanic in the morning, in the evening he becomes a reverend doctor. That's the truth. He was a panabita in the morning, but in the evening he called his church, Jesus is coming in the morning international. That is the situation we have. And when you contest his position as a pastor, he tells you that he has been called from heaven. And I know that heaven is not a heaven of confusion. Heaven has orderliness. My Bible tells me that every man is subject to governing authority. Anybody who uses heaven and no longer subject to governing authority cease to know what the Bible says. So if religious leaders become true religious leaders who can impact true religious knowledge, knowledge about love for God and humanity, because that's all religious teaches. Should we be looking to license religious leaders on both sides, for example? So we've talked about the big governance issues, but little practical things. So make it illegal for a man to open a garage and put a mat and say he's running an Islamia. Or someone like you said, opening a church, you know, and just saying, you know, Jesus. Yeah, what, yeah. I mean, are uh, see, these are the balanced like discussions that we want to have. If you want to regulate criminality, be sure that in the first place you are not a criminal. I hope you understand. If you want to regulate religious practice, be sure that you are not also an excessive and extremist.
Because the religious people will assume that if ordinary things you don't listen, if we give you the power to regulate us, you can go beyond excess. So what I'm simply saying is, I quite come back to what you said, had it been we have good governance, the issue of regulation would have been even smoother yeah. and easy. Because good governance will help the religious people to see. You see, there's something many of us don't know about this country. Part of the issue of corruption is in this country has to do with this unnecessary tension that they are raising among us. As long as we don't understand each other, as long as religious is being manipulated, then you can have corruption because anytime you want to challenge it, they will just use religion and other things yeah, I to think cover. Yeah, I think, Adria, I wouldn't go for licensing, but government has a responsibility to regulate. And they can, you know, bring in, uh, and, and it's, not, it's not difficult to know them, you know, the credible leaders, because you can know them by what they have studied, and they're available, you know, so that there'll be a kind of peer review, because they know, if you are to ask them to go to those who really know and to make themselves available, they know exactly their levels. So I think government needs to regulate, but I don't think we need to get to the, if there's going to be a licensing, you know, because regulating the religious space itself is, uh, it's, 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 I mean, it's, it's problematic. It can be done, but it's best done when you get those who are learned in the field to do it because they have the tools to do it. And but government needs to set a framework okay. within which this is done. And, and final question before I open it up for 10 minutes of audience engagement. Should we even be encouraging religion to play a part in our public life at all? Or should we be at a stage now where we are beginning that, to that, encourage that. people to, to keep religion at home. And when I say that, I'm talking about practical things. So you fill a form, for example, now, and it says male, female. You know, people will ask you your religion, Islam. So that identification in public life with how we worship, should we be looking to just now say, are, you know? There are, no. there are two issues here. Mm. The issue of identity, you know, informally identifying yourself is an issue which we can discuss. But the issue of whether you can keep religion out, I don't think that is possible. It is not possible because the way the human being has been wed. No, it's not about no. telling people not to worship. It's about no. saying your religion is between I'm, I'm you coming. and your God. I'm, I'm coming, I'm coming. You know, again, there is no cemetery in religion. You don't say that because this religion says so, then all other religions must keep so. It's a little more complex. I think what is important is that we have to appreciate that religion is so important to man because no human being can exist without meaning to his life. Religion is the only system that answers or gives that meaning to life. The moment your life loses meaning, then you'll be thinking of suicide. And that's what happens in depression. So I think we have to appreciate the religion, you know, is, 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 is so, uh, it's not possible really to, to it's, it's so inextricably linked, you know, to life. But we have been very uncreative. We can use religion actually positively for development, for good governance, for all the things that would, because almost every religion has got this feature, you know, of mercy, of accommodation, of helping others, even when they are not, you know, members of your own religion. Now, we need to bring that out. I was in the mosque. Somebody said, you must not eat, you know, the food that has been cooked by Christians during Christmas. And I pointed him to, to the verse in the Quran that says, in fact, that you are allowed to eat that particular food. The point I'm making is that, you know, you, you, you need to use religion creatively. Germany is using just that now. There are whole books written on how to use religion for development. So okay. it's possible. And they have done it for all religions, not just, you know. Thank you. Because you. you say you do want to go to the mosque at of one. Course. So I've got to stop. <laughs> okay. I'm going to just quickly open it up. We'll take maybe just three questions and then come back to the panel to close it up. This is going to be hard. Okay. I'm going to be a bit uh, selfish and start oh. with a woman, <laughs> the, the, the lady here. And then the gentleman right at the back in the black hat. And then, okay, let's do four. So two women and two guys. The lady here, two ladies here. 
the gentleman with the black hat at the back, and then one other person. Oh, <laughs> <Don't you? laughs> okay, doctor. <laughs> So we do it that way. So, yeah. And we'll take everything at the same time before coming back to the panel. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Purira. Um, thank you very much, uh, Reverend Hayab. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bugaji. Um, religion, discussing religion, uh, is really indeed a sensitive thing. Um, sitting down here, listening to both sides, I still sense a bit of denial on both sides. Um, I, will, I will start with Islam, talking about Islam and intolerance. Yes, there's a lot of Western propaganda, I agree. In fact, m I mean, Western and uh, generally globally, uh, mainstream media is Western and Christian. I understand that cl clearly. Now, the thing is, I would understand, not understand, I can't understand in Kano, for example, simply because a Christian mistakenly tears the Quran or does something, then you pounce on him and kill him. Now, we can say that it's because there's exclusion, there's lack of knowledge, but let me tell you something. I have heard numerous times, I've argued with many people, I've heard malams, and I'm glad that Dr. Bugaji has said there, there should be some form of regulation because they are fake malam. But I have heard people say, because mm. Now, please let's translate that for those who don't understand. It means that the blood of a non-Muslim is legal. That is, it's legitimate. The, it's take, legitimate. To, to you to can kill. take the life of a non-Muslim. Now, what I think is, it's more about targeting the ideology. I don't mean Islamic ideology, but targeting that ideology that promotes this kind of uh, things. Target, or targeting the narrative, sorry. Now, going back to uh, Reverend Hayab, I'm sorry to say, you know, there was a bit of denial too with uh, Christian Association of Nigeria. I've seen press conferences by Christian Association of Nigeria seriously making false accusations. And remember that it's an association. You can't hear say, Oh, you know, it's the individual that spoke. As a Muslim, what I see is Christian Association of Nigeria. So we tend to have a bit of denial, you know. Sometimes I think these open conversations are important. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Fatima. My name is Fatima Zara Umar. Um, I'm, I'm glad that um, Dr. Bugaji raised the issue of regulation because I think we're all aware that um, the gov government of Kaduna State tried to pass a, a law to regulate preaching and to regulate the teaching of Islam. And we all know the kind of backlash that got. I think they've killed the bill finally. So in an, in a, in a, in a, in an atmosphere where people, like she said, the ideology is if he doesn't practice Islam like I practice Islam, then he's a kafir. If he, if, for instance, if I'm not wearing that Izala design hijab, then I am not properly and modestly dressed as a Muslim woman. So in that kind of atmosphere, even if you want to regulate teaching and preaching, how are you going to do it? Because we have been dancing around the issue that in northern Nigeria we have a massive population that is uneducated or half educated not even in western education but in the deen itself to even understand that islam espouses you know noble qualities like accommodating people and tolerating people who are different from you so where do you start from even if you want to regulate the teaching and 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 the preaching of islam okay. please pass the mic to the gentleman right at the back and please, let's try and be quick because I've literally got five minutes and we want them to answer and then we round up. Okay. Good afternoon, all. Thank you, dear panelists. My name is Abdullah Tawheed Munakat. Uh, the Dr. Bugaje, you said uh, the elite plus political manipulation and bad governance are responsible for the problem. I agree with you. Uh, Dr. Kadiria Ahmed, what uh, we have project on ground called Muslims Integration Project Committee. 
in that project, as you said that we should discuss the solution. We have seven requirements in the project. Okay, you're not going to have time to read seven, a uh, list of seven no, things. No, okay, I'm not so going to, I'm okay. not going to read it. Okay. But uh, I have to relate it to the Islamic perspective. Based on Dr. Bugaje's listing of the Islamic organization, the Izalas, the Tariqa, and the Salafia. So all of us, we know, as we are here, we have one emotion attached to one side or the other. No one is free completely. We belong to one side or the other. So these three uh, Islamic uh, sects in mention, we know those who are very patient. Who don't cause problems. Okay, you, you really uh, do need to hurry up. Uh -huh. I, I literally, I will shut you down if you don't okay. make your point. So make okay. your point. If it's a comment, can you, you know, make it very short and succinct? If it's a question, please ask the question. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I don't have any question to ask. <laughs> no. Please take that mic to. Thank you. <laughs> Give to doctor. Uh, thank you, Kadriya. Mine is not. A, my name is Awola Anwar. Mine is not a question. I just want to emphasize on what Dr. Bugaji has been saying: the need for research and the need for deeper analysis. I have been associated with uh, conducting research on religious leaders, movements, and ideologies for about 32 years or so. Uh, Whenever there is conflict between Muslims and Christians, the issue of manipulation becomes a little difficult to, to understand. But when you, if you want to understand what Dr. Bugaja is saying, you better study interreligious conflicts. It's very easy to see, and I will give a few examples. Not too many, please. Not, not too many, not too many. Uh, in Kaduna here, there was a time in the previous administrations when there was a committee to bring this dialogue and integration and whatever. You know, in Islam, you have Izala, you have Dariga, and they pretend to be enemies. So two people were nominated, one to represent Izala, one to represent Dariga, and then some Christian groups on the committee. After the first meeting, because there were going to be some disbursements for, for, uh, to converse for support, that the Riga and the Izala representatives went to back to the, the commissioner in charge of the negotiations and said, whenever there is going to be a meeting, I'm representing the Riga. If my brother from Izala is not there, I will give you another Izala something. And if I'm not there, the Izala man will give you another the Riga. So at that level, the Izala and the Riga were merged. <laughs> because of what will come. In Bauchi, there was a time the late Bapa Mahmoud, the Grand Kaidu, was telling me when I interviewed him in 86, that there was a time when a, a village head, a Christian village head of eight, seven, over 70 years, wanted to convert to Islam with his council. And then he came to Bauchi and met somebody uh, in the Emirate Council that they wanted to convert. But they were levied because they were non-Muslim. They were levied a certain amount of money, and it, it looked as if it was Islamic uh, uh, taxation or something like that. That's how it was presented. So on the day, they, they kept on postponing. On the last day, then people in the Emirate Council or the person that was contacted decided how could he prevent these people from be becoming Muslims? Because if they convert, they will not pay that <laughs> levy either in cash or in produce. So after thinking, thinking, he told the man that, uh, okay, after they told them about uh, confession in Allah, Rasul, Bilab, they all agreed. Fasting, prayer, they all agreed. And then he said, okay, uh, blessed, let me see you privately. He said, now, the final thing is circumcision. You have to be circumcised. <laughs> he said, at my age, he said, yes. He said, uh, uh, okay. I will consult my people. Th thank you, sir. Thank Again. you. Thank you very much.
final, he wants, we, it's Friday, people want to go and pray. Whoever wants to know the end of the story should meet me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's right at the back. There's a gentleman right at the back. And then that's the, then we'll come back to the panel. People have to go to the mosque, unfortunately. So I, I can't extend the conversation. He says he wants to go, so. Uh, good afternoon, all. Uh, mine is, is a comment. We, we have um, made a conversation around... What was your name, please? Uh, my name is Katun Kwasu. Um, the conversation has um, centered on Christianity and, and Islam. And we are living in a modern world. And especially here in the north, we are being affected by modernity. There are students that are going out there to study, and then they come back to challenge the status quo. They are neither Christians nor Muslims. In this space, I so charge religious issues. When you try to be liberal and independent, there's a lot of antagonism from the dominant uh, religions. Where do you place uh, those groups? And these groups, they are not just Christians or Muslims. They are, both sides have um, people like that. Okay. Where do you present uh, the liberal or people that... Yeah, okay, so that's the question. Where yes. do you place the tolerant ones? Yes, okay, yes. thank you very much. Okay, um, Doctor, let me just recap quickly and then we can, you can respond and we close. So there was the question about the denials on both sides where we're not facing the truth about the rabid uh, ideology that some of the religions um, pursue, both Christians and Muslims. There's the issue of the difficulty of uh, regulation with an example of the backlash faced by the Kaduna state government, which actually tried to regulate. And then there is a question from the people in the other room. Someone said, how do we deal with um, some of the misinformation, particularly uh, that of young people using social media, because that is one of the ways um, that religious intolerance is persuaded. Then there's the issue of the the fact that we live in a society where actually moderates and those who are tolerant are the ones who now get ostracized and how we deal with that. And finally, um, somebody says really it's about, it's about poverty of the mind. Um, this is why we have religious intolerance. So maybe, Reverend, we start with you and we end with uh, Dr. Bugaji. Well, I'm not sure that there's a little issue of denial it is only when you want to go extreme, then you see as if it is a denial. There are issues that when you give an outright answer or say what you said the way you want it, it may also constitute another confusion. So if you said, because look, I still stand to be corrected, that because one imam said something wrong, do not constitute Islam. He is not Muslim Islam. He is just a Muslim misunderstanding Islam. This whole thing has actually been in Christianity. So, because, you see, people could be privileged to be our leaders. I have people who have followed my comments. I have had cases that Christian leaders say things and I disagree, and I come out publicly to say I disagree. I'll give you an example. There was a time there was news all over this state that, or this country, that Christians were killed in Zampara. Do you remember that? In one polytechnic in Zampara. Remember, I was the one that came and said, no, Christian was killed. We do have people who could challenge that. Why did you say that? But you see, when we overrate their position more than the position of truth, then we make them the owners of religion. I gave my life to Jesus Christ, not to the association. I only joined the association so that I can fellowship with my brothers. So there is a mix up here. I didn't give my life to an association. I gave my life to Jesus Christ, not to association. But the association helps us to fellowship. Even the local church where I worship, I went one day to a church for burial, and the pastor was preaching. He said a lot of terrible things about one leader in Nigeria, and I was surprised. As a pastor, there were about 20 pastors in that service. So the After question service, is, I, I'm just trying to come to her that the process of denial depends on your judgment. So the question really, when I just met, he went to him. I said, "What you said right now on pulpit? Let me reframe the question. Can you refer it to Christianity? Reverend, okay. Let me reframe the question. The question is." about the responsibilities that associations have um, and the fact that when people speak on behalf of associations, as far as people are concerned, they represent the position of that association. No, as members to of the association who strongly know that that information is incorrect 
can come out and have always come out to say this information is not correct. And I have evidence to show. Probably not every. You see, when sometimes you become a nuisance, every day you want to come out and refute, refute, your voice will not be strong enough. But we have evidence to show that we have always said this thing our association did was not right. This thing our association said is not right. If others don't, I, I can, some who know and have read it, I can, you can Google the stories and you'll find what I said. Just Google Reverend Hayab about Khan. There was even a time about three months ago, I was said, it was quoted in one newspaper that I am on my own. But that, that's why I don't want to say anything they said is true, is for us, because we have refuted many of them. I hope you understand. So the issue of regulation, as we rightly said, you see, all of us are saying that there has always been regulation because no church established in Nigeria that did not register. I think some people don't know this. All these churches you see, they are registered with the corporate affairs. The confusion is that if you come again, you want to say something different. As the, 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 what created confusion in Kaduna is the issue of licenses. But if you just say in the regulation, corporate affairs, anybody you are registering should do this, do this, do this, do this. This is the rule, rules concerning their money. If you accept, you go to corporate affairs. If you don't accept, you operate a church and become an illegal person. And if you are arrested, we will support government to prosecute you. But the situation where we are already going, you have a process, you come up with another and come up with another, you get the people more and more and more and more confused. I like the illustration Bugaji gave. You see, who is even, when you look at the bill as it was presented in Kaduna, who would be in charge of it? Who will do what? Automatically send signal that it will cause more harm than good. So there are issues behind that. But I just want to speak about what this young man said that interests me. This is where both Christians and Muslims have been having it wrong in Nigeria. We sometimes assume that every Nigerian is a Muslim, every Nigerian is a Christian. I'm a pastor, but I know it is not true. I have always accorded respect to non-Christians and non-Muslims because I know they have a right. And it's because of this confusion we fight among ourselves when there is an issue in Israel, between Israel and Palestine. And I want you to know that their issues have nothing to do with Islam and Christianity. Because Israel is not a Christian country, though the history of Christianity starts from Israel. But the population of Israel is roughly around 6 point something million. Only 250,000 are Messianic Jews. About 5 point something million practice Judaism. Then a little above 700,000 or 800,000 practice Islam. You understand the mix-up? So when you hit me because Israel have an issue with Palestine, you're just wasting your time because you're hitting Thank an innocent you man. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Now, let, let me start with something that you have. <clears throat> you know, that one of these uh, people asking the question said, all of us Muslims here must be either Izala or Ariga. I just want to correct that. There are people who are not Izala, and who are not Arika, who are not Shia, and I'm one of them. And we might well be, we might, we might well be the majority, it's just that we don't speak. So let us make this very clear. Now, yes, I, 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 you, you talk about denial. I don't think it is denial. I think it is a deficiency in the way leaders react to situations. I see it as a deficiency. And it is that deficiency that we want to correct. And you can only correct it when we have a regulation, you know, a, a regulatory mechanism that ensures those people who are there to lead and speak are actually learned. And more than 50% of these problems will disappear. Kaduna State tried to do that. I think Kaduna State went about it wrongly. If they had taken the basic steps of policy, even in, in, in Western governance, when you have a new policy and you want to put it in place, there are steps you take. There are states of, steps of consultation, and then you, you know, put you know, that consultation through a process before you eventually make it into a bill. I think Kaduna State was in a hurry, and that was why the whole thing crashed. But they can still learn from their mistakes, pick it up, and do the correct you know, way of doing things. We have a proposal that we gave to them, actually, but they kept it aside and did something else. Perhaps that would have worked. Uh, we all have to be ready to learn from our mistakes, but I think there are experiences around the world, what you might call the best practices that you can pick. You know, and now, yes, I think both religions, that, as far as I know, both Christianity and Islam, recognize people who are not Muslims, who are not Christians. 
And I think it has given them that room. Now, if some people out of ignorance stand up and say that you can't be but either or, then I think they are just simply making mistakes and they should not be the kind of people we should be looking up to. They are the people that we should actually make sure that we clear from the way because they are creating a lot of confusion. So I think we should be very clear about that. I mean, I know that because there isn't the time, he can quote you verse of, you know, from the Bible, I can quote you from the Quran that recognizes the right of people not to believe. And, 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 and there, is, there are no issues about that. People take responsibility for what they decide, what, what, what choices they make. And that's all that the, 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 the religious texts you know, say. So I, I don't see that you know, problem. But I think at the end of the day, maybe one final point I would like to make. I think all of us are going through the pain of seeing what is happening. Everybody is not happy with this religious intolerance. Everybody, But you see, just like we have allowed the political leadership to fall into the wrong hands, we have also allowed the religious leadership to fall into the wrong hands. And because these people at the top, like I wanted to tell you, they are all in alliance. You know, they really talk to each other and they connive together to do what they are doing. And they are actually bringing the society down. So we have to stand up to both of them. And, and that way to do it is not necessarily a violent way. We have to do it methodically, systematically, but consistently. And over time, we can recover. If you read history, you have seen how societies have gone through these things. And they have recovered. So what we need, like one of our colleagues you know, who died said, don't just agonize. Try to organize. This is what we need to do. And thank you very much. Okay. So um, um, I know that a lot of people had comments and questions. I do apologize that we're not able to take them on this session. Unfortunately, we are limited by time. I'd like to thank Reverend Joseph Hayab. Thank you so much, sir, for coming and sitting with us. And also Dr. Usman Bugaji. Um, Professor Bello Kano did send his apologies for his inability to be with us. Um, and I thank you for being here. Thank you. I've, I've heard us um, give a better round of applause than that before. Thank you. So while they're taking their photographs, um, I just want to, to say something very quickly. We understand that people have to go to the mosque. So what we're going to do is that two o'clock event, we're going to move it to three o'clock. So everything today will happen an hour later. Um, we might not need to move the poetry session forward, however, we might still be able to just maintain that time. So let's see how we can do it. See you at 3 o'clock. Thank you.